I really hope that we get to do this face to face as well as online. Um, you know, staring into screen at the moment without the interaction of uh, my fellow healthcare professionals is, 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 it has meant that we can reach out to people far and wide. But, um, until we get that interaction again, uh, I really, I really do miss it. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm not a hip surgeon. That's my disclaimer right from the start. I'm a knee surgeon, but I'm an orthopedic surgeon. And I'm going to talk about osteoarthritis affecting the hip and the knee, the different options that are available. I'm going to talk a little bit about the group. I'm going to talk about pathology. I'm going to talk about non-operative management. And then I'm going to talk about, of course, operative options. Um, as, for, uh, as this talk is uh, put together by myself, and I work closely with my good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Adrian Wilson. So this is a common um, scene in theatre. We do our procedures as a team. Um, we, this is myself and Adrian together with our assistant, Nunu, uh, doing a procedure together. And the reason why I put this slide in, because it just reflects as, as, a, as a group of orthopaedic specialists having an MDT approach to managing our patients. We share a common aim of providing um, good, um, a, a good education um, pushing the boundaries for research and innovation so that, the, that our patients get the best that they possibly can. Adrian's a friend of mine and he's, my, he's one of my mentors from when I was on fellowship and I, he really pushed the frontiers of knee surgery in the UK and, I, and he's a real um, innovator um, and he's part of my team. Dr. Van Heerwarden, he's a, a specialist that comes in from um, Holland that I work closely with who is a specialist in um, osteoarthritis around the knee joint. I'm going to spend a bit more time talking about Christian because he truly is an innovative surgeon and some of the patients you'll see at the end of this uh, talk, and hopefully he may even join us this evening, are based around the approaches he takes to the hip, which are truly innovative and um, approaches that are not commonly performed. So he's, he's a truly genius surgeon. Myself, I'm a, I'm a surgeon based out of Guy's and St. Thomas's in my NHS practice. I'm so excited to be working with the team at the Nuffield and leading up the knee service there. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I've got a real interest in uh, research and education, and um, hopefully our teaching program will demonstrate just how interested we are in providing that. It, it, the evening wouldn't be right if I didn't speak about my good friend and colleague, um, Ali Nurani, who's a leading shoulder surgeon and is actually leading up the, um, the, the, the project together with, um, from the orthopedic specialist side, together with Nuffield. He's our medical director, and a lot of you may have come across him before for his work in, in the field of shoulder surgery. Mr. Tony Andrade was um, due to be giving this talk today. But sadly, as, as James mentioned, through, through a few things that haven't gone quite so, so well, he's unable to do it. And he's, he's just come off being the um, president of the International Hip Society. He's truly a leading hip arthroscopy surgeon. Um, and he's, he does, develops and designs a lot of the techniques of hip arthroscopy. He's truly a leading name in that field. And so, and this is my uh, also good friend, uh, Mr. Sebastian Dawson Bowling. Um, a lot of people who work with um, the Nuffield Group will have come across him. He's also been working together with Ali and Nurani to, to make this um, a reality. And he's both a hip and knee surgeon. He also deals with um, revision surgery. So when things don't go quite so well, he's there to help uh, bail um, bail people out. So we just want to, these are slides just demonstrating the um, importance of clinical excellence, research and innovation. We have regular students coming to learn from us and do studies. Um, the education side of things you're already seeing with the with what we're providing on a full basis. Um, I'm proud to show off this little trailer that we did where we basically did a course talking about joint preservation surgery. We had 11,000 people tune in to, to this. And it's because we are leading in the education space, but also um, the space where, um, where, where joint preservation techniques and joint replacement techniques are performed. So, so uh, I know we don't have 11,000 this evening, but hopefully uh, as we get to know each other, you'll be able to attend a lot of our courses and online events that we, that we run. 
and you'll be able to learn from each other. So before I go into the process of osteoarthritis, we, we're going to talk a little bit about the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis in surgery. Now, when people start off doing certain procedures, the, the initially the response from the community is that it's you know this is new, this is not a good way of doing things, and we've always done things a certain way, and that's a better way of doing things. And therefore, the innovators are normally at sort of two and a half percent on the on the on this side of the curve. Gradually, it becomes normal practice, and and as we go through this um, innovation curve. Um, the people who were sort of initially throwing tomatoes at the innovators are now part of the um, part of the norm. And we'd like to see ourselves at the left of this curve, where we're really pushing the boundaries of um, orthopedic surgery, providing an evidence-based practice, and making sure that the patients who are coming through our care are getting the best possible um, care, um, depend depending on their pathology. So osteoarthritis is a huge problem in the UK. It affects over 17 million people per year, with over 30 million working days lost each year. It's got a huge NHS um, spend of 4.7 billion, and in fact, it's the third highest spend for the NHS. And 20% of um, people who have this can have osteoarthritis have a lower employment rate compared to somebody who doesn't. Over a quarter of people will retire earlier because of the condition of osteoarthritis. So it's a real um, disease burden. It affects the UK in a similar way throughout. So between 26 to 29 percent throughout the, um, um, the United Kingdom. And it affects the female population more uh, with a prevalence of 31.8 percent. We know that it's a disease or, or associated with deprivation. So you can see here, it does affect younger patients, even 45 to 64 age group, and but it does disproportionately affect uh, those from more deprived outcomes, deprived um, areas. This is data from 2017 demonstrating that we had um, over 100,000 uh, joint replacements performed just in that year. And it was a rise of 1% the year before, compared to the year before. Now, this isn't unusual. And in fact, the reason why I haven't presented more recent um, data is because of the pandemic and that has skewed the results. But if you look at year on year prior to these figures, the numbers have always been in the region of 100,000 and they're increasing every year. The BMI is high and you can see in the HIP um, group, the BMI is 28.7, so patients are frequently overweight with the main diagnosis of osteoarthritis. And once again, this slide shows that it affects the female population more. With the knee replacement data, actually the, the, there are there are more, and it's still around the hundred thousand mark, slight reduction compared to uh, the previous year. And these patients have a obese BMI with an average BMI of 30.8. And the vast majority have osteoarthritis as their primary diagnosis. And it's a similar, um, and once it affects the female population slightly more, and the age group is typically around 69. So what's the current situation? Well, people are finding it difficult to get to healthcare professionals um, because simply because of the lag in um, uh, that's been produced with the pandemic. Fewer operating lists um, have occurred over the last two years. And uh, we're now back on the, on the mend and we're doing more and more procedures to deal with this backlog. So more and more patients are waiting and it becomes vitally important that even more so than before, that working together with um, physiotherapists, general practitioners to try and manage patients who have got arthritic pain, whether that's with a physiotherapy or, um, or um, adjuncts, that we actually look after these patients has become more and more important. So what is the philosophy that we're trying to keep with, with these patients? Well, in this slide, this summarizes everything in my talk that I want to get, get, give to you guys today. The, the, what I'm trying to keep is patients in the green. And, and this is what we're trying to achieve together, is that we keep patients going with very simple things. So. Um, making sure that if there's bracing techniques, we provide them with braces. 
if there's physiotherapy, rehab potential, we, we give them the rehab options. If we can manage them with pharmacology, with simple injections or um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, that we keep them in that area. The thing that I'm interested in is osteotomy. Now, this is still an operation, but it's a joint preservation operation. And what we're trying to do is stop them, stop them going down the route of having replacements. So this applies to both knee and hip arthritis. And what we're trying to do is consider options which are non-interventional. As I mentioned, um, uh, intra-articular injections or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Now, when we introduce steroids in any joint, the whole point of it is to try and reduce inflammation within the joint. It works on the synovium of the joint. So the synovium is the lining of the joint, which um, gets inflamed and that has pain receptors within it. And that can generate pain and causes, causes um, the issues that we mentioned earlier. So um, unable to work, having to take pain relief and really affects their activities of daily living. There are different types of steroids, steroids on their own, depamedrone, hydrocortisone, and those that are combined with hyaluronic acid. The, there is some systemic absorption when you inject into the local joint, and, um, and given that we've had the recent pandemic, there is a scare that it may, that may interact with the viral lung injury. So there has been some advice to try and use this with caution, but there's a very limited link with causing worsening symptoms in those who've got um, previous viral lung injury. So non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs um, are, are, can be very useful um, for osteoarthritis. And the advice is from a government level that even though there is a concern with regards to its use in COVID-19, that patients should not stop taking them. Okay, because they can be very effective. Other therapies, so the Osteoarthritis Research Society International looked at the evidence for efficacy and they looked at 60 interventions for osteoarthritis. And this was a really interesting um, uh, study because they categorized the, the effective treatments based on published evidence. And lo and behold, it revealed what a lot of us already know that actually level 1A evidence for um, land-based exercise programs with physiotherapy was the most effective way of managing osteoarthritis. So, so often it's an education, education for patients to explain to them that this is very effective. Topical non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs also have really good evidence for them and, and I use them frequently in my patients. Level evidence, so evidence level 1B, so still really strong evidence, um, but not as good as level 1A, was pool-based therapies. So for those of us who are fortunate enough to have hydrotherapy available for our patients, or just even a simple pool to be able to do aqua-based therapy, aqua -based therapy it, it can be very effective. Oral non um, can, can can also be effective, providing there's no medical contraindication. And intra-articular hyaluronic acid. So now this is quite an important part of my practice. I use hyaluronic acid quite a lot in early osteoarthritis. It's something that wasn't really considered to be useful in the past, but the evidence for it has been very strong and is as shown in this particular slide. So how does hyaluronic acid work? Well, it works to mimic similar substances found within the knee that, are, that are, provide lubrication and shock absorption. Now, these are very simple terms that we, that we use. Hyaluronic acid is far more complicated than that. But this is the type of terminology that one can consider using when discussing it with a patient. The more recent formularies are as a single shot rather than multiple shots, and it can be combined with steroids. The, um, the data demonstrates that it can provide pain relief at and beyond three months, and can be um, combined with a steroid with a really good safety profile and potentially better, better outcomes. So how does bracing work in, in osteoarthritis? Well, the point is, is to offload the disease compartment. It can really um, reduce pain and improve function, and it may buy some time to, before undergoing the procedure. 
it's not unusual for me to have patients who do a lot of walking and as part of their jobs to to um, to have braces, um, offloader braces, and they can do their day to day activity without any major issues. So how does a bracing work? Well, this is just an example of a varus knee with medial osteoarthritis. And effectively what the brace is doing is, is um, applying forces over three defined areas to open up the part of the joint which is, um, which is painful. And so you can see from the simple diagram, a lot of you have seen braces like this, applying a force um, on the medial side on both the femur and tibia and laterally at the knee level of the knee joint can open up the medial compartment of the knee. Now, I find it useful because it can improve function without having to have an operation, but also it can help to mimic what an operation may give from a symptomatic um, uh, view um, before you do the procedure. So it's a try before you buy. So I think it's a very useful adjunct. This is what they look like. Um, this is one of the brands that we, that we use. It's called an Unload of One. And this is particularly useful for medial compartment osteoarthritis. You can get the one that offloads the lateral side also, but this is a good starting point. What we often forget as orthopedic surgeons is that actually it's not just about the joint that we're focusing on. It can be above and below. So, for example, with the foot orthoses, by getting the by providing them with a heel heel cup and a and a medial arch support. It can be really effective, particularly in early to moderate osteoarthritis. So gait analysis is key. We're going to talk a little bit about other types of injections which are new and, and can, can, be, can be, when I say new, they've been around for many years, but the data on it is just coming out now. So some of you will have heard of platelet-rich plasma and, and bone marrow aspirate. This is an example of a platelet-rich plasma. Um, I borrowed these slides from a colleague of mine, which demonstrates the Arthrex system. There are lots of different systems. They all work on the same principle. And PRP basically works to take the blood from the vein of a patient. You spin the blood in a centrifuge, and you take the cells which are anti-inflammatory um, from that, um, from that um, uh, centrifuged blood and injecting to the affected joint, affected joint. Here is an example of when it can be done. So this patient's had a micro fracture performed for a large chondral lesion. This is the um, femoral condyle. Um, this is what it looked like before uh, with these loose edges. These have been um, debrided to stable edges and micro fractures been performed and you can add in platelet rich plasma at the same time. So what else can we offer? Well, joint preservation surgery and joint replacement surgery are things that we, we do a lot of work in on a sort of educational level. Um, myself and my colleagues are part of um, the committees, leading committees across Europe, and we do a lot of publications and presentations on, on this particular area. Um, myself and Christian uh, Clay, we, we, we do a lot of key opinion leading work for joint replacements, as does, in fact, Sebastian Dawson Bowling. And we do a lot of publications on arthroplasty, and uh, we do a lot of joint replacements where indicated. So I'm going to quickly run through a bit of, on joint preservation surgery. Those of you who are here for my last talk, I went into a lot of detail about this. But just a refresher, joint preservation surgery is dealing with patients who've got osteoarthritis affecting one part of the joint, and they may have bow legs or knocked knees. And their weight-bearing axis goes to a particular part of the knee joint, which, um, which causes them to have pain. So if you're in varus, you're likely to get medial joint pain with joint arthrosis. And we simply offload that part of the knee. And I'll show you that in, a, in another slide. So what happens if we leave these patients as they are? As you can see from these slides, it's a slippery slope. You start off with a bit of joint space narrowing, that joint space progress, narrow, narrowing progresses until you've got full blown osteoarthritis and they need joint replacement surgery. So why do we try, why don't we just do a knee replacement early on and really help the patients um, get over their osteoarthritis? It's not as simple as that. We know that in reality, 
particularly with knee replacements, 10% are ecstatic. They're really like, they're amazing patients. 75 to 80% feel they're glad they got it done, but their knee doesn't feel normal. But the bit that we're really concerned about is the guys on the left-hand side, the 15% who feel worse, and of which 2% may have had a complication. So this is what we're trying to avoid. Now, if you look at the happiness curve for a hip replacement, it's completely different. The vast majority of hip replacement patients are delighted. They do very well. Um, it's a much easier recovery. And they will often say that the toothache, hip pain, and groin pain that they had before has gone. So, so I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying this, this particular curve applies to both hip and knee. It certainly doesn't with the hips. But with the knee replacements, this can be a problem. So if we're going to try and preserve the joint, the best kind of patient is a, young, is a younger patient who's low BMI, has got a high demand, and they've got malalignment. If they're overweight and they've already got fixed flexion deformity of, and the osteoarthritis affects multiple joints, it's not likely to help them. This is a typical example of a patient with osteoarthritis of the medial compartment of the knee. We've done an osteotomy to change the mechanics of the weight-bearing axis. So this line is from the center of the hip down to the center of the ankle, and it's going through the inside of the knee. By doing the osteotomy, we've now made it go through the middle of the knee joint, and we've offloaded the medial compartment of the knee. Very effective and can get people into quite significant activities, um, and they maintain their own, own knee joint. This is an example, and obviously we show our best patients, but he, this, is, this is the kind of level of activity one would expect. But it's not for everybody. So you can see this gentleman here on the left-hand side, slightly older gentleman who's got lower expectations, but still wants good, good function from his knee joint. He's perfectly suitable for a uni, whereas these two patients on the right here, much higher demand from their, from their knee joint and were suitable for osteotomy surgery. Um, we, we do these through clever incisions now. They're, they're, quite, they're quite small, quite low, comorbid, low morbid procedure um, in the right patients. Surgeons from around the world will come and get this procedure done. And if you ask surgeons what they would they rather have, would they rather have knee replacement, whether that's partial or total, or an osteotomy, the majority will say uh, they would prefer an osteotomy. And this chap uh, flew in to have his done. And a couple of months later, he was on a water park. So you can get really good results. It's not just for young patients. It can be effective for fit and active older patients. This is a friend of mine um, who sent me these videos across from Japan. It's a very different kind of rehab. Um, but, you know, it's, 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 as, as, it's purely to demonstrate the message that it's very good in older patients also. So let's talk about joint replacements. We do both partial and total knee replacements. And just how good are they? This is a 63-year-old um, gentleman who presented with medial knee pain, and he had instability. Clinically, he was deficient of an ACL, um, and he had grade 3 um, images on x-ray, but grade 4, which is bone on bone, on MRI scan. Now, we've had really good experience with unicompartmental knee replacements. And so this patient would be just the kind of candidate who would do well from a partial knee. And in fact, we've had 90% survivorship at 10 years. And that's in keeping with the registry data. This particular patient, because he was deficient of an ACL, we did a combined ACL reconstruction with a partial knee replacement. And you can see patients love sending us their videos. Now, particularly when they're, when they're able to get back into this level of sport. And I'm sure you would all agree, we'd be delighted if our patients were able to get back into this. It's not a one-off. Um, this patient is an ex-military, really high demand from his knee, had multiple injuries during his time of service. And as the slide says, you know, a partial knee replacement for a knee surgeon is like doing a hip replacement for a hip surgeon. So, you know, we, we really enjoy doing these procedures. But it's not all doom and gloom um, for total knee replacements. This is, a, as you can see, a slightly older gentleman 
but he had no comorbidities really. And he said he said he didn't want to have two operations. And you know, after much arm twisting, he 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 wanted he wanted to have both his knees replaced at the same time. And we did this for him. And this is him um, a few weeks after his operation. So in the right patients, you can do both knees at the same time, but it's not the recommended way of doing it. It's really in select patients. So this is another patient where we've done bilateral knee replacements on. Once again, it's not the norm, but you know this is a younger um, patient who's got quite horrific disease in both his knees, and he just wanted to get back into his farming. Um, he did so well after surgery that actually the, the hospital that we were working at at the time wanted to make a video on him, just demonstrating that actually you can achieve a really high function after knee replacement surgery, even though that's not considered the norm. Um, doing, utilizing certain techniques, having great anesthesia support, great physiotherapy support, and making it, you know, making it clear that it's a team effort and not just one person doing a procedure, but to get good outcomes. I had a similar patient um, um, at Guy's Hospital, and she featured in the Telegraph, just because she did, you know, they, they wanted to get a piece on knee replacements, and she had staged knee replacements, and, and she, she did very well. It's the same patient we spoke about earlier. I'll skip past that. I put this slide in because I wanted to highlight that actually it's a team effort. If it's a complicated patient, it's not unusual to have certainly two surgeons doing the procedure. And this just happened to be a case where the patient also had a shoulder problem. So um, um, Ali was also there with us doing the shoulder part. But, it's, but I only put this in to demonstrate that actually we completely recognize that it's a team um, event and that without our and nursing colleagues, pre-assessment colleagues, physiotherapy colleagues, and general practitioners, you know, working together to get the good, get a good outcome, it just wouldn't happen. Now I'm going to talk a bit about hip replacement surgery. Now you will recognize this gentleman on the left here is uh, Professor Adrian Wilson, and he um, had terrible hip osteoarthritis. It wasn't unusual for us to be walking down the road and he would be dragging his leg behind us. Um, and he'd really be suffering, but would be suffering from this. And so he decided to get his hip replacement done, and he flew over to Hanover to get get the hip replaced by by Christian Clay, purely and simply because we'd seen Christian do his thing. The type of approach he uses is truly unique, and he went across to um, Hanover to get this done. This is a hip replacement. This is Adrian's hip replacement. And you can see um, that this is a this is the stem going into the femur. And note that there's no cement around this hip replacement. This is an uncemented hip replacement. And certainly in younger patients, this is a good um, option. In older patients, we we might we, we may use cemented hip replacements. And in fact, they have got fantastic data in the National Joint Registry. Um, so cemented hip replacements work equally e equally well, but in younger patients we try and um, try and use uncemented hip replacements, and the, the bone bonds into the hip. This is Adrian um, at the airport day four after surgery, on his way back, very mobile, happy, pain free, um, and getting back into action. So why why is Christian's approach? Um, a, a good approach. Well, this particular approach is called the Rottinger approach to the hip, and I'm just going to go through a bit of anatomy to show why his approach is different. To set the set a background, there are lots of different approaches to the hip. The vast majority in the UK will undergo a posterior approach to the hip. That involves taking the short external rotators off the back, getting a good exposure, and doing the procedure. And that is a really good, effective way of doing hip replacement surgery. The more old school approaches are the anterolateral approaches, um, as described by the Watson-Jones approach, which can give a Trendelenburg gait after the procedure. And more, more recently, there's been a um, renaissance of the anterior approach uh, to do hip replacements also. 
Now, we're all trying to achieve the same thing, and, and, and however, there are um, benefits to each and every approach, and I'll go through the approach that is the one that um, Adrian underwent, and particularly because it's minimally invasive, and it's one of the few approaches which does not cut any muscle. So in order to do the approach, we do it through an MIS um, incision, which is minimally invasive surgery. But the key is, is to be able to see what you're doing, and, and, and that's allowed, that is possible through this approach, but also preserving the surrounding muscles without affecting the neurovascular structures, which are very nearby, and putting the uh, procedure in, in the right orientation. Now, this is the cross-sectional um, diagram of the hip joint, just to orientate yourselves. This is the acetabulum. This is the head of the femur. This is the greater trochanter. This is the front of the hip. This is the back of the hip. Here are the neurovascular structures. And this line is utilizing this approach to be able to go between the muscles rather than um, go through the muscles. So there's a safe triangle to go through. The approach is between gluteus medius and tensor fascia lata. There's no division of muscle or tendon, which is typically done using other approaches. You can get a fantastic view of the acetabulum and femur, and all through an incision which is only up to 10 centimeters long. The posterior capsule is kept intact, and therefore there's a lower risk of dislocation. You can make it a long, larger approach if you need to, if you run into any difficulty. It isn't an easy approach, it's not for the faint-hearted, it does take time to, to, to learn, and it's important to be able to have a good assistant when you do the procedure. So I'm going to show you some pictures of how the procedure is done. Like all approaches, it's about making sure you do the, getting the patient in the right position, on the lateral side, and they're supported with their leg out. These are the clever instruments that we use. Now, these are the pictures that I really wanted to show you, just showing that actually you can utilize, you can move the muscles out of the way and get down to the hip joint without cutting anything. This is just a diagram demonstrating the capsule overlying the front of the hip. This is the femoral neck that you can see here. And once you've made the cut through the, the capsule, you're down to the neck of the femur. And you can see once you've cut the femur, you, can, you are looking directly onto the acetabulum. Now, when you're doing other approaches, you sometimes need to look around the side. But actually with this approach, and I've, and I've helped Christian with many of these procedures, you look directly onto it. Now, this may not mean a lot to, patient, to, to people. This is obviously a speed, sped up um, um, a video of him demonstrating the procedure. And I'm just going to sort of go through the key steps that he's performing. So he's just gone through skin. He's gone through fat. You've got the fascia lat you've got you've got the fascial layer that you go through. You find a natural interval through the tensor fascia lata and the gluteus um, muscles. I'm just going to skip further along. This is him just about to insert the cup. And that's the cup inserted. Now, the, the, the gist of this is that it is a very, very quick approach, even with a sped up video. This is what the x-ray looks like afterwards. You can see the hip in situ with the, with the, um, the head and the acetabulum. And this is what we expect our patients to be doing post-op, getting them up and about, getting them into their normal clothes, being able to feel like they're, this is a sort of normal day for them. But of course, it's not. They've undergone major surgery. We can do bilateral simultaneous hip replacements. And this is an example of a gentleman who's had both of them done at the same time. And this is him the next day and being up and about. We're happy and confident to get these patients um, walking without any walking aids. And, you know, but of course, you know, if they're not ready to do so, we will, we will slow them down where needed. But you can see here, this patient is quite happy to do so very early on, and, and he was a happy guy. So we, we've got, uh, this was de developed by Professor Rottinger, and looking at Christian's results, out of the 15 years that he's had as a consultant, 
he's had one deep infection. Now that's unheard of. It's a really um, you know unusual um, statistic. It's not unusual to have to have them as a day case. He's had no dislocations at all with no nerve injuries. This was um, just a couple of weeks ago. A patient walking three hours post surgery. He's carrying his own uh, saline bag. And you can see he's a slightly older gentleman. And, you know, he's 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 smiling. You know, this is not just because the hip replacement's gone well. It's because we've had good prehabilitation. He's had good anesthesia, and and obviously Christians used his approach. So it's a multimodal approach. This lady had a her right hip replacement recently. She'd had her left hip replacement done six months earlier. Once again, this is the next morning after surgery. So it's less than 24 hours and she's quite happy um, mobilizing without any significant discomfort. This gentleman had his hip replacement done on the same day as the previous lady. He'd had his bilateral tibial osteotomy done by us uh, the year before. And once again, you can see he's, he's obviously walking a little bit gingerly. He's had a hip replacement operation, but these patients are very happy. Now, this is very unusual, and this is completely not the norm, but I put this video in because actually we couldn't believe he did this after surgery. So this gentleman is also three hours after surgery, and he's got no pain at all. And we didn't ask him to do this, but he decided to show that he had no pain at all, and he's... That is nuts. Yeah, and it is actually nuts. So what, we did the surgery. When did we finish the surgery? Three hours ago. Three hours ago. Three hours ago. Okay. Amazing. Now with the knee replacements, it's it, it you can we can do them as a day case, but this is definitely not the norm. We try and get the patients um, having early physiotherapy in a, when their pain is really well controlled. They've got all the blocks in place, and you know you can see he's quite comfortable, but still getting them to getting their quads to function and getting them going can be tricky. He's already achieving a 90 degree bend uh, within a few hours after surgery. We don't use a tourniquet, um, and I think that really helps. So the take home message is it, it's become quite standardized a procedure for, for Christian, and it, the steps are, like, are, prim, are the same every single time, but it can be a tricky procedure, very low dislocation rate, um, and, and can be used in obese patients. So that's the end of my talk. Um, I hope that's been useful for you, particularly from a knee surgeon's perspective, delivering a, both a hip and knee talk. I hope I can, I, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, if you do want to get in touch, please get in touch via the team at Nuffield. Um, th these are, uh, this is my email address. And I do do a lot on social media. So we do try and talk about um, different bits of pieces of education we're delivering. So do keep in touch. Thank you.